Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Hadley German and I am the Eugene B. Adkins Curator here at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's webinar held in conjunction with the exhibition OKLA. Before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. So we have muted all of our attendees microphones, but there are two ways for you to communicate with us today. And that is through the chat box and through the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. So we would ask that if you have a question for the museum staff or about um, logistics, we would ask you to put that in the chat box. And if you have a question today for Dr. Bailey, our guest presenter, we would ask you to put that in the Q&A box and he will respond to your questions at the end of the program. You can type a question in the chat box or the Q&A box at any point during his presentation and then we will be sure to respond to them either during the presentation or at the end. Well, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Robert Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Oklahoma, where he teaches on modern and contemporary art, as well as the historiography and methodology of art history. His research explores how artists and art historians respond in theory and practice to societal, environmental, and technological changes. His recent publications on conceptual art include Art and Language International, Conceptual Art Between Art Worlds, and Terry Smith's One and Five Ideas on Conceptual Art and Conceptualism, both published by Duke University Press. Dr. Bailey regularly writes about art history and nature as a member of Fieldworks, a writer and artist-run program that conducts interdisciplinary research in American deserts, and for the Inhabiting the Anthropocene Research Group here at OU. Today, Dr. Bailey will share with us about the life and career of the celebrated comedian, composer, and Oklahoma expatriate, Mason Williams. Please join me in a warm Zoom welcome for Robert Bailey. Thank you very much, Hadley. Um, I'll just imagine like rapturous applause. <laughs> and things like that. Um, but uh, um, uh, my first time presenting like this um, for a public audience on Zoom, so I'm, I'm just imagining I'm there at the Fred with you all and we're having a, a better time than we are. But. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Hadley, for uh, the, the warm welcome. Um, I also want to thank um, Amanda Boehm Garcia for inviting me uh, to give this talk um, and sending me down the, uh, the Mason Williams rabbit hole, which is a really fun place to be. Um, and I also really want to thank Mark White, who curated the OKLA exhibition, um, which is a terrific exhibition. Come and see it if you can. Um, and if you can't, check out the catalog. And uh, thanks to Mark for inviting me to write an essay for that catalog. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started with the talk. I've given it the title, um, Rowing to Galveston, which you'll have to look up on your own. I'm not going to explain it, um, which is in a bit, uh, well, in, a, in the spirit of the talk in a little, um, in a way or two. So um, the subtitle is The Art, Music, Writing, and Comedy of Mason Williams, 1967 to 1969. Um, and I want to open with a pair of epigraphs, one from a good friend of Williams's, um, Steve Martin, who's probably known to you all, um, who wrote a joke for the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour um, back in the late 1960s um, that he claims in his memoirs sort of saved his career. Um, and uh, the joke is, uh, it has been proven that more Americans watch television than any other appliance. Um, and I will be talking um, about uh, uh, television quite a bit today. Um, and uh, the second epigraph comes from um, Mason Williams um, himself, uh, in a, a book that he wrote after the Smothers Brothers uh, Comedy Hour was canceled, um, and he was writing little notes and uh, to himself about um, about television and his time working um, in TV, um, and he noticed that the public will watch anything, and suggested that maybe we should show them something worth watching, which is also um, very much sort of in the spirit um, of the talk today. So, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Mason Williams's work spans art, music, writing, and comedy, so there are many ways to approach it. And I want to take an art historical approach today, um, by which I mean I want to follow some of my inclinations as an art historian and relate Williams's work to some artistic problems. Um, I do this by treating his whole enterprise as an art practice, all of it, not just the music or not just the art itself, but also the music, the writing, and the comedy, uh, because I think there's an artfulness running throughout everything Williams does, 
that responds to one of the great problems in 20th century art. And it's a problem that we inherit in the 21st century. And the problem that I have in mind involves the avant-garde and audience. Audience, specifically the finding of mainstream acceptance, was the avant-garde's persistent stumbling block. And it remains so for any and all art that extends its efforts to politicize culture by reconceiving what art is and does in the world. To quote the avant-gardist Marcel Duchamp, who's up on your screen on the right-hand side, in the last analysis, the artist may shout from all the rooftops that he is a genius. He will have to wait for the verdict of the spectator in order that his declarations take a social value and that finally posterity includes him in the primers of artist history. So the Dadaists in Zurich or the Surrealists in Paris or the Constructivists in Moscow, they all hoped that their visions would wipe away bourgeois society. In the end, none did. The art remained too willfully and stubbornly opposed to its own acceptance, and many, like Duchamp, became members of the Groucho Marx Club, seeking refuge in kinds of individualisms as respite from the recalcitrant failure of new communities forming from their shock tactics. After World War II, however, the avant-garde's project recurred in the form of neo-avant-garde's, countercultures, and other manifestations of what you might call the Karl Marx Club, that again hoped that their visions or revisions would wipe away bourgeois society. But the problem of audience um, uh, recurred alongside them, uh, now reconfigured, however, as a problem concerning the mainstream's voracious appetite for transgression. Among the artists exploring options at this time was Mason Williams. And for a brief moment, I think he found a kind of solution to the avant-garde's problem with audience that made real headway then and retains enduring relevance now. And while his specific solutions do not endure in the exact forms that he devised for them, they changed how political satire finds its way to the general public through the circuits of mass media. And the broad outlines of his approach remain effective today. Paradoxically though, Williams's reconfiguration of art's relationship to politics has been at the same time, both widely influential and in a way totally overlooked. So I think it deserves some closer scrutiny that will parse some of its modes. Born in Abilene, Texas in 1938 and raised between Oregon and Oklahoma, where he befriended a young Ed Ruscha, Williams did stints at Oklahoma City University, at North Texas State University, and in the Navy before finding himself reunited with Ruscha in Los Angeles, California, where he began to pursue a career that almost simultaneously became several careers as an artist, musician, writer, and comedian, with the year 1967 being something like his Annus Mirabilis. All of his work was marked by and effective because Williams deployed a sensibility trained not only on his avant-garde predecessors, but also on the middle American world he inherited growing up on the plains. In other words, his ability to connect to audiences owed much to his understanding of them, understanding inseparable from things he learned during his immersion in the conservative cultural climate of his upbringing in Oklahoma. Though he did most of the art, music, writing, and comedy that infiltrated the lives of an increasingly large number of people while living and working in Los Angeles, a center for the production of American popular culture, he did so as an Oklahoman. That is, as someone who understood how to format his thinking to connect with audiences who might balk at unfiltered modernists, beatniks, or hippies. And in so doing, he landed his blows against the empire somewhat surreptitiously. If the avant-garde tends to preach to the converted, Williams figured out how to get other ideas to the evangelized. Um, and he may have learned a thing or two about how to do this from a fellow Oklahoman named Oral Roberts, who began his televangelist uh, broadcasts in 1954. Regardless, Williams recognized that the cultural landscape was changing and that the avant-garde would have to participate in it to persist. So very quickly, Williams's intertwined pursuits came to involve art experiments that anticipate or parallel ideas and concerns central to conceptual art, as well as a smattering of albums on the Warner Brothers label, including one featuring the chart-topping hit Classical Gas, for which he's probably best known in the popular imagination. On top of that, a series of books, some self-released in limited runs, but others published by Doubleday in editions numbering in the tens or even hundreds of thousands, and a gig writing for the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour that brought his humor to CBS's mainstream audience every Sunday night until the show 
plagued by censors, got canceled after its co-host Tommy Smothers refused on principle to let Williams's writing team's work get shredded by a network supplicating itself to small-minded complainers. Williams was up against forces that Duchamp, whose Dadaist sensibilities and jack-of-all-trades tendencies a young Williams much admired and incorporated into his own repertoire, had not been. For in the interval between Dada and Williams's time, the avant-garde had, almost inexplicably, found itself becoming popular. Beat literature, rock and roll music, underground film, pop art. All of this was enough to scramble thoroughly the distinctions between high and low culture, kitchen avant-garde, modernism and mainstream, and it opened up further opportunities for reconfiguring the culture. Enter Williams, a prankster conceptual artist doing a folk singer slash classical guitarist act, writing odd books full of witty poem jokes while dishing out political satire on the tube, able to take advantage of this situation because he understood it from so many angles. Steeped in the concentrated version of America's culture that Oklahoma affords, as well as the emergent counterculture that was mixing older and newer media together in destabilizing configurations, he found himself positioned to leverage his own cultural literacy in ways that might unsettle the balance of things. Williams had been born into a very different world from the one in which he set to work. Clement Greenberg, in one of the programmatic statements of the avant-garde, his landmark 1939 essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, published shortly after Williams's first birthday in the immediate aftermath of Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland, proffers a vision of a sharp divide between true art and mere propaganda. In it, Greenberg discusses the audience problem in a way that proved highly influential on artists of the post-war generation that picked up the avant-garde's project again. I'm going to quote Greenberg at some length here. He writes, the avant-garde specialization of itself, the fact that its best artists are artists' artists, its best poets, poets' poets, has estranged a great many of those who were capable formerly of enjoying and appreciating ambitious art and literature, but who are now unwilling or unable to acquire an initiation into their craft secrets. The masses have always remained more or less indifferent to culture in the process of development, but today such culture is being abandoned by those to whom it actually belongs, our ruling class. For it is to the latter that the avant-garde belongs. No culture can develop without a social basis, without a source of stable income. And in the case of the avant-garde, this was provided by an elite among the ruling class of that society from which it assumed itself to be cut off, but to which it has always remained attached by an umbilical cord of gold. The paradox is real, and now this elite is rapidly shrinking. Since the avant-garde forms the only living culture we now have, the survival in the near future of culture in general is thus threatened. So much for Greenberg. A lot changed between 1939 and 1969. Culture survived, but avant-garde and kitsch might have been the new generation's rallying cry. Unchanged though, whether in the 1930s, the 1960s, or now, is this. Those pursuing cultural politics face the problem of audience, tied to the problem of financial support. The umbilical cord of gold that tethers resistant cultural practices to elite patronage remains strong, and a mass audience capable of sustaining such culture remains to be formed. Avant-garde art stays at a basic distance from the general public, which, as in 1939, lacks the time, interest, or inclination to investigate what Greenberg calls its craft secrets. And this remains unfortunate, because those tricks of the trade remain effective stuff for opposing what in the world we find objectionable. And were the majority to favor and support the avant-garde, the world we would be better off. But the problem of audience remains the great impediment to change. And this brings me back to Williams and to his craft secrets, which enabled him to solve the avant-garde's audience problem for a brief but energetic moment before money returned things to the place where they were and remain, though not without opening up enduring possibilities for cultural resistance. Revisiting, via some of his more obscure artistic experiments, several bodies of Williams' more popular and accessible work from the late 60s and early 70s, specifically the albums he released on Warner Brothers, the books he published with Doubleday, and his role as a writer for the Smothers Brothers on CBS, opens a window onto the possibility that the ideas and values of the avant-garde can and do appeal to non-specialists if the artist making the culture is, as Williams was, 
deeply sensitive in a way that can at times seem oddly very Greenbergian to the medium in which culture reaches its audience. And it is possible to get paid by the elite to do this work against that elite's better interests. We might call this funny business. And in discussing Williams's work, I hope to give his scattered projects a more unified and robust profile to reveal its craft secrets and thereby further to open up as Williams himself already does so well, the prospects for a world that makes more use of what the avant-garde offers us. Because of his simultaneous self-promotion, such as naming an album, The Mason Williams Phonograph Record and a book, The Mason Williams Reading Matter, as well as his self-effacement, writing behind the scenes for television or making works that seem as if they unravel themselves through self-parody or faux grandiosity of gesture, Williams's contribution needs to be consolidated like this and highlighted lest it get lost. Though we still do not know how to wipe away bourgeois society and though television does not play the same role that it did in the late 1960s, in large part because of Williams's work, for artists still lodged in the ever evolving culture industry and bucking against the system, his tactics can help. So Williams's artworks may be the least widely known of his endeavors, but they hold keys to his entire project. Art has long been a part of Williams's life owing to his childhood coterie of Rouchet's Ed and Paul, Joe Good and Jerry McMillan, a group augmented by Patrick Blackwell and others upon their arrival in Los Angeles. Williams roomed and palled around with Ed Rouchet for much of the late 1960s, thinking up artworks and conceiving hijinks while cultivating the sensibility that also permeates his other cultural production. Indeed, the artwork as inside joke was among this group's regular tactics, akin to the circles of jokers not far away in Davis, California, around the teacher William Wiley that, for instance, riffed on a found object dubbed a slant step, which generated both Bruce Nauman's mold for a modernized slant step of 1966 and Stephen Kaltenbach's slant step two of 1971. This was a junk shop find that became like a repeated reference point for this group of, of teachers and students. Um, back in Los Angeles, Ruche, working in a similar spirit, designed the cover to Williams's rather literally but equally playfully and humorously titled 1969 album, Music. The Warner Brothers seems to have thrown his original painting, a typical Ruche work of the period that gives intense and evocative visual form to a single word, into the trash after photographing it mistaking it for a disposable piece of concept art. Proof that their approach did not register as such with the powers that be, thereby empowering its subversions. The album credits as if acknowledging how awkward and ineffective this image might be when strapped to a commercial product that would need to be associated with the specificity of Williams rather than the generality of music as such if it were to be sold, cheekily read, sorry, cover by, Re by Ed Ruscha. This sensibility had found earlier expression in an artist book called Royal Road Test, a group effort between Williams, Ruscha, and Blackwell from 1967, made while driving back to Los Angeles from Las Vegas, where they had been working on Williams's self-published The Night I Lost My Baby, a Las Vegas vignette. And uh, Royal Road Test is another what you might call joint venture um, between the group. In the Mojave Desert, Williams chucked a faltering Royal Model X typewriter from the window of a 1963 Buick LeSabre, moving at speed with Ruscha behind the wheel. The group, curious, circled back to survey the wreck and Blackwell photographed the typewriter's remains as scrupulously as detectives would document a crime scene. The trio publishing the results as an artist book, a format that Ruscha had helped to develop beginning with his famous 26 gasoline stations of 1963 and that Williams himself used on many occasions during this period. Royal Road Test uh, mixes well the matter-of-fact yet double entendre sensibilities of its makers, whose work combines a kind of literalism with its own tongue-in-cheek subversion. The ability to be both po-faced and two-faced is one of Williams's not too closely guarded trade secrets, and it enables attitudes that allow one to survive in a hostile cultural climate um, while facilitating one's contrarian speech, entering into and affecting it, and it suffuses his work. The 1967 performance art Earthwork Sunflower is ostensibly the first of Williams's artworks, 
and we find that same disposition already on display here. To produce the work, Williams hired a skywriter to fly over Apple Valley, California, and with his airplane, create a stem with attached leaves that would link the summit of a modest peak to the newly risen sun. The horizon, which is literally the ground, comes to stand for itself symbolically, while the literal sun stands in figuratively for the blossom of a giant sunflower that ephemerally configures itself as a coherent image, only from the specific point of view that Williams and his photographer Tony Esparza occupied prior to its dispersal into the atmosphere. Anywhere else, and the image does not cohere or align as such, appearing instead as some meaningless scribbles in the sky by an errant skywriter. At any other time, it's not there at all. But in that time and that place, for those with the right kind of eyes, message sent and received. In other words, with Sunflower, Williams shows us how to send a message to those attuned to receive it and only to them. The remote desert location underscores this as its sparse population compared with the urban density of nearby Los Angeles ensured that the total number of people who saw Sunflower remained small. On the one hand then, this work is a dumb bit of stoner, stoner humor, very much of the sort that Williams and Ruscha repeatedly cooked up in their collaborations and cohabitation. Um, a joke that only the guy sitting on the other side of the couch might find funny. But on the other hand, and the more unlikely but no less real hand, it's a surprisingly prescient work of art, very much of a kind with contemporaneous developments in what have come to be called conceptual art and land art. Though it's mock sensationalism or insincere embrace of a kind of spectacle clashed with the more cryptic tendencies of that rarefied art. So compare Williams's wordplay to Bruce Nauman's in Waxing Hot, also from 1967, in which the artist applies a coat of wax to the sculpted word hot, sort of like a sunflower waxing hot, not so far off from using the sun as part of a sunflower. Or compare it to Nancy Holt's film Mono Lake, shot in 1968 on a road trip that she, Robert Smithson, and Michael Heitzer took to Eastern California while the three artists were each on the cusp of producing their first large scale earthworks, um, very close to the site of Williams's own earth earthwork, which is really more of a sky work, in which case it anticipates Robert Barry's inert gas series from 1969, for which Barry released volumes of gas into the atmosphere above Southern California, including in the Mojave Desert, the gases gradually spreading outward from there, taking on planetary scope. Williams's other early artistic effort is a similarly vast and, and uh, a piece and similarly finds itself in good company art historically. Bus, a project also from 1967, is a poster depicting an image of a Greyhound bus at one-to-one -one scale. Published as a multiple in an edition of 200, each poster is housed in a cardboard box that contains information about its production. Weighing in at 10 pounds, seven ounces, the poster is 10 feet, three and a half inches tall by 36 feet, two inches long. It reproduces a photograph made by Max Yavno from an originally 16 inch by 20 inch print and a four inch by five inch negative, so quite an enlargement. The Benline Process Color Company of Dillon, Florida and Pacific Display of Los Angeles, California receive credit for screen printing um, the, uh, the poster. The process of assembling the poster's panels with 120 feet of double-sided tape each and folding them to fit the boxes required nine man hours per copy, totaling over four and a half miles of tape and uh, 225 eight-hour working shifts. The box produced to a design by Bob Willis after a box that his wife found under their bed was fabricated by the Names Company of Los Angeles in time for the work's publication on February 24th of 1967. Prominently exhibited in the Museum of Modern Arts lobby during the run of the Word and Image exhibition from January 25th to March 10th of 1968, the museum's copy of Bus includes signatures and other graffiti-like text applied to it by artists in the exhibition. It perhaps goes without saying that Bus is the largest poster in the museum's collection or at least it was when it entered, maybe something larger has entered since. Um, perhaps owing to its association with a design exhibition, scholars such as Lorraine Wilde have discussed it primarily as a design project that picks up on contemporaneous developments in the arts, but I think it has a deeper resonance with art itself, 
prefiguring often rather than refiguring what artists at the time were doing. Um, Buss's life-size scale is in keeping with other important conceptual artworks of the period, including Joseph Kasuth's series of proto-investigations, the best known of which is One in Three Chairs of 1965. This date is somewhat contested, Kasuth having claimed that he conceived of the work in 1965, um, but Benjamin Buclot notes that their earliest documented appearance is a 19, uh, February 1967 exhibition at the Lannis Gallery, making the works almost exact contemporaries of Buss. In each of his proto-investigations, Kasuth juxtaposes three elements, an ordinary everyday object, here a chair, a dictionary definition of the word designating that object, here the word chair, and a photograph of the object reproduced to scale and in the location where the work is being exhibited. Much ink gets spilled about the objects and the words in Kasuth's uh, pieces here, the former syncing with Duchamp's ready-mades nicely, um, themselves also largely everyday items, and the latter opening the door to conceptual arts approach to using language in a visual arts context. Less is said, however, about the photographic component, um, which seems to stand in for something like the redundancy of images as copies of things, and thus of art's pointlessness if we construe it merely as the naturalistic representation of the visible world through a kind of literalistic depiction. After all, we already have things. But it is the photograph here that most insists on the equal reality of all three components, thing, its visual representation, and its linguistic designator, in their different registers, precisely because it insists on sharing the thing's scale and showing it in its place, thus claiming for itself not the qualities of the thing, but whatever a photograph has that the thing of which it is a photograph does not. The similarities here actually highlight for those willing to look all that its differences in dimensionality, format, color, utility, and so forth entail. In other words, you can do things with a photograph you can't do with a chair. Williams's bus similarly makes much of the life-size scale of the reproduction as a reality-insisting principle. The loss of place in Williams's work when compared with Kasuth's is significant too, underscoring how difficult it is to place the bus in conventional spaces where art gets shown. Its exile from MoMA's galleries to its lobby is one example of this. Place at real scale like this is also a theme in Mel Bachner's measurement room of 1969, for which the artist places information about the dimensions of a gallery in that very room as an artwork with no object being presented. If measurement room is a place without an object, insisting on life-size scale, then bus is an object that struggles to find a place because of its life-size scale, and this may account for it having found a place more in the history of design than the history of art. But together with one and three chairs, all three works are now in the Museum of Modern Art's collection, equally recipients of the prestige that this confers, though Buss was actually the first to enter the garage. In 1962, Ed Ruscha made a painting um, titled Actual Size, featuring a can of spam seeming to fall like a meteorite through empty white uh, canvas populated by stray drips of blue paint, a trail of yellow paint streaking behind it, containing the scrawled words, actual size in capital letters. Hopefully you can see that, but if you can't, the, the bits of writing there in the yellow say actual size. Um, above that uh, little bit of action, the spam logo in block capitals um, can appear massive by comparison. Um, and the salient point of comparison here concerns subject matter. A can of spam, is puny um, compared to a Greyhound bus. And the reality effect of bus is all the greater because of its massiveness. Then again, um, compared to something like Sunflower, which incorporates in theory, a sizable portion of the solar system in its reality, the bus is quite small. Though its status as a multiple that would reach more people than Sunflower, which was really visible as such only to the crew that made it happen in the first place and maybe some accidental passers by, um, began an inversion of what bigness meant in Williams's work that would impact his subsequent turn toward more popular media and smaller images or smaller things like books and records and television shows. So the idea here is to make a work that turns inside out Sunflower's use of perspective to configure messages for certain people with the new goal of reaching potentially anyone with the message, even without them realizing it. The hope being that people would get the avant-garde and even, quote unquote, get it um, like an inside joke. 
bus could, for instance, show up in the official spaces of the art world, um, like the Museum of Modern Art, but it could equally serve as the backdrop um, for the photograph of Williams that Jerry White made for the cover of his debut album for Warner Brothers, um, which appeared in February of 1968, while bus was hanging in MoMA's lobby, so two places at once, and which features two of Esparza's photographs depicting sunflower, one a shot of the plane in the sky, and the other of Williams looking up, his mouth slightly agape, the sun reflecting in his wayfarer sunglasses. This album, which contains Williams's mega hit classical gas, also includes a track called Sunflower, which begins as a gentle arpeggiated classical guitar number, vaguely Spanish, with a prominent descending bass line over which Williams whistles a tune. Midway through, an accordion appears along with light orchestration that swoops and swells to a climax that it sustains briefly before petering out in a dissipated way. A musical analog and a soundtrack for the process of making Sunflower and letting it go. So if Sunflower, the artwork, is a kind of literal flower power, the power that the sun exerts through its energy coming down to earth, kind of mimicking Allen Ginsberg's 1965 coinage that became popular with the counterculture, um, made in the, the direct form of a giant energy source, then Sunflower is evidence of how Williams's work feeds off of its own energy. Projects done in one of the arts having cascading effects in others. An artwork calls for a soundtrack, for instance. Another artwork provides a backdrop for the cover of an album on which that soundtrack appears. So here, the idea of being life-size or reality-affirming that we get from Bus functions as another tool in Williams's kit, another one of his craft secrets. So if his work makes clever play in the space between the literal and the figurative, as it does in Sunflower, it does so within the confines of material reality, real things begetting other real things, scaled to the lives that people live, hence the exhaustive listing, I think, of every company with which he worked to realize the bus project. Sunflower, it turns out, was a financial bust, a dump of money into the air above a remote spot in the Mojave Desert. Sunflower the song, however, was its recuperation as part of an album that spent 28 weeks on the Billboard charts, peaking at number 14 and garnering three Grammy Awards, two for Williams and one for producer and arranger Mike Post, more than making up for the prior loss. And that's not a bad recovery, especially considering that Williams has said he sunk his life savings into a failed attempt to film the Sunflower proceedings, the sun damaging the print while it was being exposed to the camera but the money made up from the record sales. So at first, the Mason Williams phonograph record, a popular, indeed award-winning success, does not seem to belong to the history of the avant-garde, but I think that it does. As an amalgam of classical guitar, folk, bluegrass, easy listening and pop, it's decidedly not difficult, and its acquiescence to smooth production values and instrumental competency stands in contrast to a lot of the avant-garde music both art and rock of the times. But I think that this is a feint that enables this album and Williams's music in general to smuggle countercultural values, as well as often critiques of those values into mainstream spaces where audiences not looking for them might unintentionally find them. Obscurity, often an avant-garde value, is easy enough to have after all. Audiences are the hard thing to find. And Williams was not alone in his quest to bring what on the back of the album, um, the liner notes writer Stan Cornyn calls the largest flower ever done to the masses. For instance, Yoko Ono would, through the attention that her marriage to John Lennon brought her, find herself using artistic strategies drawn from her participation in the avant-garde Fluxus movement on records she uh, released on the Beatles' Apple Records, um, including an album cover um, on her 1970 plastic Ono band um, album that is nearly identical to that of her husband's also uh, album also titled Plastic Ono Band from the same year. The point being that someone in a record store might mistake the one for the other and get an accidental dose of experimental music and avant-garde thinking, something they might also have done while tuning in to see John Lennon on the Mike Douglas show or the Dick Cavett show, or maybe bumping into Yoko Ono's book Grapefruit, republished in 1970 by mainstream press Simon & Schuster. Similarly, Andy Warhol operated across multiple arts, ushering the neo-avant-garde energies of pop art into popular awareness. And that included things like facilitating 
uh, musical recordings and performances by the Velvet Underground, as well as bringing underground cinema to wider recognition through his collaborations with Paul Morrissey. Around the same time, the conceptual art collective Art and Language was partnering with Mayo Thompson and his psychedelic rock band, the Red Crayola, to bring Marxist theory and conceptual art to, if not exactly everyone, then at least a certain kind of popular music audience that may not have considered it before. In the second issue of Art and Language's journal, The Fox, Mark Kleinberg asked the important questions about this sort of work, questions about audience. He asked, could there be someone capable of writing a science fiction thriller based on the intention of presenting an alternative interpretation of modernist art that is readable by a non-specialist audience? And then the follow-up question, would they care? In effect, Williams was attempting just this, perhaps implanting more critical notions there than some of his fellow travelers because he hid his medicine in a spoonful of sugar. Ono's shrieked vocals, John Cale's screeching viola drones, and Thompson's multi-stylistic abrasiveness on the Red Crayola's records all probably put off as many as they turned on. Um, each in the end probably remains for the cognoscenti or those aspiring to um, the status of such. By contrast, however, uh, Williams probably turned a few people on without their even realizing it. And that's something else altogether. It's maybe closer in spirit to Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury cartoon um, from the time, which appeared impossibly amidst the kind of utter pap that makes up the comic section of the newspaper. And I think it's no coincidence that Mike Doonesbury, the, the character after whom the strip is named, is from Oklahoma. He's from Tulsa. Um, humor, or a sense thereof, was a uniting thread in Williams's art, music, and writing, as well as, it goes without saying, his comedy. And his comedic sensibility owes a larger debt to the avant-garde friendliness with nonsense and noise characteristic of Dada than it does to some of the preceding histories of comedy in the United States. It structures all five of his genre hopping albums for Warner Brother, as well as the playful books of writing, drawing, and photography that he published with Doubleday. Um, these two being the, the most um, widely circulated, the Mason Williams reading matter and flavors. That much of their contents is recycled from earlier self-published books in smaller print runs suggests Williams' desire for wider circulation of this material, as well as in keeping with the umbilical gold, cold, cord of gold motif, um, an easy way to fill the content and, uh, and get the paycheck for the book. These forays into mainstream culture and its capacity to distribute his work wider and even further than, for instance, the Museum of Modern Art could, are unconventional for a purveyor of the avant-garde, as such people tend to stick to the margins, viewing the mainstream with suspicion, if not scorn. And in contrast to artists who turn to such culture for material or subject matter, while retaining occupancy in the more rarefied realms of art, people like Robert Rauschenberg or even Warhol, who remained a kind of underground figure, at least during this period, later he becomes more of a celebrity. Williams immediately plunged headlong into major labels, mainstream publishing, and mass media without looking back. The idea that the mass media could be an outlet for experimental art was not entirely anathema to conceptual artists in the late 1960s, however, as Alexander Albero astutely notes, they often courted publicity in ways to which their predecessors would have been allergic. For instance, Dan Graham, at the upper left-hand corner of your screen, conceived his project Homes for America for publication in a mainstream magazine like Esquire, though he ultimately settled for Arts Magazine. Um, Joseph Kasuth at the lower left exhibited his investigations in major world newspapers by buying advertising space. And at right, Adrian Piper similarly bought advertising space for distributing parts of her Mythic Being project, um, but in the local Village Voice, a kind of alternative paper that's heard down at the bottom center of the, that page of the newspaper. Um, also famously, um, Ed Ruscha uh, announced his engagement to the twice future Mrs. Dana Ruscha in the pages of Art Forum's January 1967 issue with a photograph by Jerry McMillan. Um, by comparison though, Williams was either more wholly committed to using mass media or more sensitive to it as a medium that if utilized correctly, that is in a way that would not baffle but reach its audience, would not only be a vehicle for his work, but also potentially for broader social change. And it was really the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour that was to be the vehicle for his most effective forays into mainstream culture. Along these lines, Williams debuted Classical Gas 
on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour in 1967 with Buss as a backdrop for his performance. His many talents coincide here. The medium is television, the format comedy variety show that he helped to write. The content is palatable music and in the background, head scratching, but not obtrusive avant-garde art. Williams had written classical gas as gasoline for the classical guitar repertoire in his words, but now it's fuel for the bus. Classical gas appeared again on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, accompanied by a film by Dan McLaughlin. This is at the right side of your screen. Um, and the film is in the exhibition and on YouTube if you wanna find it. It features approximately 2,500 works of art flashing on screen in rapid sequence. And at the end of the video, the viewer is pronounced cultured. This is a Dadaistic gag, I think, typical of Williams's creative work for the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. And indeed, Sunflower, the song, the instrumental song based on his earthwork, also featured on the show as musical accompaniment to a dance piece shot using new slow motion replay technologies originally developed for broadcasting sports. So the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, which aired from 1967 to 1969 on CBS, began innocently enough with Tom and Dick Smothers, a brother act, transitioning from a sitcom format, originally called the Smothers Brothers Show, to a variety format um, with Williams among the writers. Um, Williams had just finished a, a stint writing for the short-lived Roger Miller Show. These are some um, uh, graphics that uh, Williams and Ed Ruscha developed um, for that. Um, which was hosted by the country music singer songwriter and uh, Oklahoman Roger Miller on NBC during the fall of 1966. Um, he'd also previously contributed to the Smothers Brothers 1964 album Tour de Farce, American History and Other Unrelated Subjects. After first meeting them in Colorado in 1960 and later reconnecting after a, uh, getting a songwriting job that brought him to Los Angeles. Williams lent the Smothers uh, various musical ideas in exchange for picking up comedic tips and that led to their working relationship. The brothers double act featuring Tom as a slow dim-witted simpleton and Dick as a straight man was like Williams, both comic and musical. Tom played guitar and Dick played upright bass and they too share the kind of literal figurative interplay and life-size reality affirmation um, that Williams possessed and built it into their shtick. Wholesome, playful folkies from an urban coastal background, the Smothers Brothers were a political act somewhat in the vein of Oklahoman Will Rogers when their show debuted. They were not really a politicized act though. However, during the first season, a mixture of factors quickly prodded them, especially Tom, toward a more radical and engaged approach. A sketch from the show's first season about the censorship of television, which to that point had been a medium strictly regulated by private interests, and largely unwilling to entertain much criticism of the status quo, brought the show into conflict with network censors for the first time. The censors preferring that viewers not be reminded that they exist at all. And Tom, in a clever bit that aired on a subsequent episode, showed the band sketch, but not by airing it. Instead, he literally held up and read excerpts from the script in a way that did not illuminate its actual content, but got across the larger point that television censors exist and they shape what audiences see. Indeed, television is a kind of medium of lying, deceiving, um, it's outsized, it's reality um, warping. Uh, it's a force for control in the lives of everyday ordinary people. So began a back and forth escalation of censorship and crying foul that ultimately led to the show's cancellation in 1969. Driving that content was Mason Williams who cognizant of television as a medium, understood how to slot effective political speech into its particular framework. And the key was to make productive use of polysemy or the coexistence of many meanings in a word or phrase, as well as amphiboly or the semantic ambiguity that affords a single sentence with a multiplicity of interpretations. So play with the literal and the figurative served Williams and the Smothers Brothers in somewhat loopy but very effective ways. And in so doing, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour came to serve as a crucial vehicle for ushering political satire onto television, including back into the very middle America from which Williams had originally come. As a variety show, it also welcomed musicians such as Pete Seeger, Harry Belafonte, and Joan Baez to air their political views about everything from the Vietnam War to racism in the United States 
and the generally sorry state of American politics. Seeger performed his song Waist Deep in the Big Muddy for the show, but censors blocked it, then caved and let him return to perform it again. Belafonte participated in a devastating but very funny bit featuring him singing the song Don't Stop the Carnival in front of a montage of images depicting police officers beating protesters at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Baez dedicated a song to her then husband, David Harris, who was facing a prison sentence for draft dodging, only to have her critical opinions edited out from the broadcast, but via an obviously awkward cut that told everyone what they needed to know. For his part, Williams helmed the team of writers, many of them young and getting their start in film and television, including Steve Martin and Rob Reiner. Together, they made the art of double entendre into a technique for evading censorship. Williams hired Martin personally, initially paying him out of pocket until he secured a proper gig on the show. Apparently, it takes a banjo-picking, art-loving comedian to know one. Amid plenty of routine routines that essentially filled airtime, other skits featuring Lee French as a typical hippie girl might include her discussing quote unquote roaches as a code word for the remains of marijuana cigarettes within a scenario where she could be understood to be discussing cockroaches. So slipping something past the censors. Similarly, the comedian Pat Paulson, who had originally been doing an opinion segment in which he weighed in critically about controversial issues, including the second amendment, eventually became a candidate for president um, at Williams's urging his campaign becoming a site for the mockery of political double speak that's really the diabolical opposite of Williams's double entendres. So all of this uh, brings the kind of Dadaistic sensibility um, of Sunflower and Bus toward a mainstream audience, segueing onto television and proving that the tactics of avant-garde art could be made palatable to middle American audiences who are at least willing to change the channel away from Bonanza on a Sunday evening, letting avant-garde ideas flow into their homes. Um, but there was pushback from the network. Week after week, CBS's censors made their edits and cuts to Williams's clever attempts to evade them, a cat and mouse game with high political stakes. All told, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour's ability to speak truth to power was unprecedented on American television. Um, but by the time of its camp, uh, and, and by the time of its cancellation, had become a template for subsequent efforts to hold politicians accountable in the media. In effect, the floodgates were open and the avant-garde had entree to new kinds of audiences. The cancellation of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour though was a harbinger of things to come in more ways than one. While Tom Smothers' lawsuit against the network on a breach of contract charge did yield a $776,300 verdict against the defendant, CBS's extra legal efforts to suppress critical speech was the real victory, part of a protracted stifling of countercultural sentiment that would become a full-blown backlash within a decade. Even former Smothers Brothers writers would join in the process. Around this time, Steve Martin writes, I smelled a rat. The rat was the age of Aquarius. I cut my hair, shaved my beard, and put on a suit. I stripped the act of all political references, which I felt was an act of defiance. In 1981, retiring from the stage, Martin released his final comedy album, The Steve Martin Brothers. Its title, an obvious allusion to the television program on which he had gotten his start at Williams's recommendation. On the album's front cover, Martin appears in front of an American flag as a Reagan era yuppie, kind of crass, materialist, uncaring, and narcissistic. On the back cover, he appears as his long-haired, bearded, banjo-toting former self, maybe the way he looked well in the Smothers Brothers writing room, and the stars in the flag are here replaced with a peace symbol. It's a kind of joke about what the 1970s were, and it's maybe not a very funny joke. By quitting the stage, Martin was not really leaving his audience behind, though. Instead, he was ceasing to confront it directly so as to expand it enormously. He took his act to Hollywood, where he made a fortune as a movie star following the runaway success of 1979's The Jerk, which he co-wrote and which Carl Reiner, father of his former Smothers Brothers co-writer Rob Reiner, directed. The sort of conceptual comedy that Martin had honed since he first encountered the Mason Williams reading matter while studying writing for television at the University of California, Los Angeles, 
found its destination in a series of increasingly sentimental and insipid mainstream comedies in which his wild and crazy guy becomes an increasingly tamed, embittered, and enraged bourgeois everyman. The nadir of this process may be the scene in his 1991 remake of the Spencer Tracy film, Father of the Bride, in which Martin's character, George Banks, erupts in the aisle of a supermarket that dares to sell its hot dogs and hot dog buns in packages of different numbers. Infuriating to be sure, but wholly uncensorious. The cost of audience, it turns out, is often impact. Here, all of the stick it to the man energy of the Smothers Brothers comedy hour is visited upon a hapless guy stocking shelves for minimum wage. Little wonder that Martin has appeared on screen less frequently in recent decades, hewing back Williams way by returning instead to his banjo, to his love of art, which he's collected since acquiring an Ed Ruscha print in 1968, even writing a memoir, waxing nostalgically about those early days before fame and fortune. In that memoir, uh, Martin writes that comedy imbued with a hint of conceptualism in his terms, um, fell victim to the evils of the 1980s every bit as much as conceptual art did when art got dragged closer to the cultural mainstream by a free market sinking its teeth into it with great relish and a large appetite. Of the latter, conceptual art, Benjamin Buclo has put the matter in particularly bleak terms, writing that the Enlightenment era triumph of conceptual art, its transformation of audiences and distribution, its abolition of object status and commodity form would most of all be short-lived, almost immediately giving way to the return of the ghost-like reapparitions of a prematurely displaced um, painterly and sculptural paradigm of the past, so that the specular regime which conceptual art claimed to have upset would soon be reinstated with renewed vigor. So if conceptual art had transformed acquiescence to instrumental, instrumentalized reason into critical awareness of that rationality before reverting to the spectacle from which it had emerged, then the kind of conceptualist comedy that had thrived on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, once fiercely anti-war and anti-racist, had been depoliticized and become all too comfortable with stereotypes about othered, marginalized, or exoticized people. Claiming to be making fun of a jerk can be a mighty concept, and behind that guise, you can make fun of anything and get away with it. So no wonder the audience laughs so hard on the records when Martin says his trademark, well, excuse me. They're jerks too in their way, but maybe not so self-aware about it, and maybe Martin is trying to tell them that, and maybe the critique doesn't land all that effectively, and the audience fails to get the message. So here, on this point, I prefer someone who was born as Martin was not, a poor black child, and that's Richard Pryor. I'm gonna show you a clip of him talking to the journalist Bill Boggs on Midday Today in 1977 about NBC's reasons for walking away after only four episodes from the Richard Pryor show, which had skewered American racism in a way very similar to much of the content on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. One of the things I want to ask you though, do you, do you really think that some of the guys that you dealt with at yeah. NBC, no, no names, right, because right. there's lawsuits for that too, that some of these guys really want to promote racism actively, or is it a subconscious? I, I just think it's part of capitalism, is to promote racism, yeah. right, in order to uh, make things work. If you feel better because you're white and you can get a job, uh, you use that. I mean, you know, I would. Absolutely. Say, I'm sorry, Jack, but shit, they say I'm white. I'm going to use yeah, this. Right. Absolutely. Get this job. I'm hungry, you know. But, uh, and that separates people. So they keep people separated, and that keeps them from thinking about the real problem. That's, that's as simple as I see it. Probably it's not that simple, but. No, all right. So how to keep that thought on the air over and over and over again? Um, Williams, for his part, voiced a similar sentiment in his FCC um, report. Uh, he wrote, uh, the Smothers Brothers show was kicked off the air not for censorship or contract reasons. It was kicked off for not pacifying. It didn't direct your attention away from social problems. It called your attention to them. So the audience wants what it wants. And had it not, in the end, been audience, that bugbear of the avant-garde that brought down the Smothers Brothers comedy hour, was it not all of those persistent letters from America's small trolls, a large share, no doubt, from middle America to their local CBS affiliates that in turn complained to the network's headquarters at BlackRock, that in turn again led Robert Wood, the new CBS president, 
perhaps fearing pressure from the new American president, Richard Nixon, to sick his lawyers on the show. The fears are as old as capitalism. Profit will diminish if eyeballs leave the screen and advertisers get wind of that. And the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, beleaguered by censors making Swiss cheese of the show with their scissors, had been experiencing a dip in viewership, suggesting that audience and the umbilical chain or cord of gold was going elsewhere. If the show had been number one in the ratings, Williams and his team could have written anything they wanted for Tommy to say about Vietnam, racism, censors, or Nixon. But the lost audience, as ever, inhibited the avant-garde, though Williams had irrefutably proven that avant-garde energies could extract themselves from marginality without diminishing their bite before the, the cord of gold got cut. Williams, for his part, fulfilled his record contract with the help of some eponymous share pickers, uh, a riff on the idea of share croppers as hired hands, the album's cover featuring a mason jar with the word improved on it, suggesting that bringing all these other musicians on would mean mason plus an improvement. And again, he's punning in that interval between the literal and the figurative. He then went home to Oregon, fixed up an old trailer and hit the road, fishing, swimming and hiking, climbing around the West for about a half a year before settling down, picking up gigs here and there at bluegrass festivals and writing occasionally for television, including stints at the Glen Campbell Good Time Hour and Saturday Night Live. The latter a job he left fairly quickly and even dissed as, quote, working for the head shop at Sears. When the television stops working, in other words, it's a good idea to go outside and have a look around to see what there is to see. Subsequently, Williams's main concern has maybe been environmentalism, the subject of a 1982 concert and 1984 album, both titled Of Time and Rivers Flowing. His accumulated collection of river songs, which he's performed to all manner of audiences in various combinations, numbers in the hundreds, and the songs themselves span back hundreds of years. So to conclude, recognizing the significance of moving water, both literally and figuratively, in ways that are life-sized and reality affirming. Now there's an avant-garde idea worthy of acceptance by a mainstream audience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for joining us today and for that fascinating presentation. I'm going to give our audience members a few minutes or a few seconds to type questions if you have them into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And while you're doing that, I wanted to shout out to a couple of special guests that we have in the room today. Um, the artist Paul Roche has joined us. So welcome, Paul. We're so glad that you're here. Also, family members of Patrick Blackwell are, are among the participants, so including his son, Christopher. So we're so glad that you have joined us today as well. And also, I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Mark White, who is the curator of the exhibition OKLA and who is in the audience today, as well as Kate Ware, who presented about Jerry McMillan two weeks ago. So we're so happy that you're with us as well. Um, and I think we have a couple of questions to start off with, and I would encourage the rest of you, if you have a question for um, for Robert, to go ahead and enter that when you have a minute. But it looks like Mark has a question for you, Robert, and he asks, there seems to be more humor among the California conceptualists in the 1960s and 70s than elsewhere. Is this an accurate assessment? And do you believe that there is a reason for this? Maybe the proximity of Hollywood. Yeah, um, I think that is an accurate assessment. Um, and uh, um, I, there's a guy named uh, Jacob Stewart Halavy uh, who teaches at Tufts, who's I think actually writing a book on that very topic, um, kind of the the, the California vibe um, among uh, West Coast conceptualists and, and comedy is a big part of that. Um, I think having Hollywood around, I think just the general laid back, easygoing nature of California played a big role. I also just think at that moment in the 60s, um, New York is the center of the art world in, in the States. And the fact that uh, you're not there if you're in LA, that distance just gives you a lot of freedom and it's easier to just kind of, you know, mess around and have a good time. Um, and I, I feel like Oklahoma is like that today. You know, we're not the dead center of the art world. So there's a certain freedom that comes with that um, to maybe try projects that you wouldn't have tried if the spotlight is bearing down upon you in a, in a major art center. Um, and I definitely think, yeah, humor creeps in out West um, 
because I think also you've got to find a small group of people because it's also specific kinds of humor. It's often those inside jokes that bring people together. Um, and I think the group in OKLA OK is a great example of that. Um, that group up in, in Davis, which is, you know, it's a university town, but it's also a real cow town. Um, and, uh, you know, for there have been people like Bruce Nauman and William Wiley and, and Stephen Kaltenbach there, um, you know, they, they would have bonded really closely and just thought up the weirdest insider gags to entertain themselves. Um, whereas if you're in Manhattan, you know, like every block has a major artist living on it. Um, it's, it's, uh, you're like watching your back more than you are like making jokes. But I think there's also a kind of sense of humor. I mean, every, everybody that I've met from that time period um, who was around in New York, um, they're also like good spirited, funny people who get a joke. And I think there is more humor in a lot of that art um, than people let on. Uh, it's just that once maybe uh, you know, major institutions in the market get their hands on it. You start to treat it more seriously and, and not think of it as funny business anymore. Um, uh, it just becomes business. And uh, um, so I, there's, there's probably as much humor in Donald Judd if you just look for it. But uh, I do think there's definitely a spirit of, uh, of playfulness out West that's uh, sort of distinctive to the, to the region, yeah. Mm. Um, well, kind of on a related note, there's a, a comment from one of the um, attendees who says, it sounds like Mason's fight with CBS was a fight against original fake news. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, in doing all this research, uh, you know, uh, well, I guess just our times are very uh, ripe with points of comparison to our country's history. Um, and uh, in, in, in digging into to Williams deeper than I had before, I kept reading things that felt like they were written in, you know, 2020 or 2021, you know, like, wow, this is enduringly relevant just, you know, in a sense, like replace TV with the internet or, you know, social media or something. And, you know, it, it lines up in a lot of ways really nicely. Um, I mean, I think the difference though would be that back in the 60s and 70s, well, 60s, let's say, um, it's, it's not so much that the news is fake, it's that it's just not telling you all that much about what's going on. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you could watch Walter Cronkite every night for half an hour and uh, really have no idea the reality of what's actually taking place in the streets or protests that are going on or, or all of that. Um, it's sort of a, a lack of information. And now we have too much information, which means that if you want to find someone who's telling you that the vaccine is Bill Gates implanting a chip in your body or something like that, you can find it. Um, and so it, it, it's a kind of fake news uh, in the 60s, but it's like a fake news of, of shrinking the information pool. And what, what he was really doing is blowing that open and saying, look, there's room for us to talk about the Vietnam War, or there's room for us to talk about racism on television, um, even if the local or, you know, the, the nightly news isn't going to do it, or the, you know, the, the sitcom format isn't going to accommodate it. Um, and he really opened that door, I think, more than anyone else I know of to letting that content into those spaces. So it's not just, I think of him as like something like the Daily Show with Jon Stewart at the helm in particular, but even afterwards and all the kind of alumni of that show like uh, John Oliver and Samantha Bee and, and, and all of them, they're, they're bringing that attitude into, into the comedy that they do. But I think it's also like evident on, what Williams did is evident on like even just sitcoms being like willing to take on issues that, you know, that, that probably a sitcom in the 60s wouldn't have done. Um, so, uh, yeah, just opening up the space of speech to allow for that content to get an airing in places and to people who might not otherwise have access. And I think that's so key. Um, but our current problem has other, or our current situation has other problems where it's like, how can we keep information away from certain people that's, you know, corrupting their thinking or something like that? Right. We need like Mason Williams as a vacuum cleaner in reverse or something like that, getting things out of the ecosystem. Well, this is here's another question for you, which is kind of related. Um, and well, at least in terms of, of um, the influence of the internet, I think in the digital age. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're asking, how do you think the internet has transformed the reach and scope of artist practices into an all encompassing expression rather than having only the artist's work as the record or, or yeah, the record or declaration of that artistic practice? Um, and then it goes on, so I'll come back and reread okay, okay. if you need me to. But but they ask, how do you view the boundary between art and entertainment, and how art how are artists today subverting or playing with that boundary? Yeah, that's that. The whole question there is really good, um, and it gets at a lot of what Williams is um, not just alone, but his whole generation was sort of grappling with. Um, you know, how do we take 
rock and roll and TV and, uh, you know, this kind of new cultural landscape um, and uh, hang on to its popularity and its appeal, but imbue it with content that's not, you know, um, otherwise there. And I think that there's a whole generation of artists now who are figuring out how to do that with the new technologies and new media formats that we have today, whether that's, you know, uh, social media or VR or, um, you know, anything that's popping up these days, video games being a space where um, those are extraordinarily popular with young people and a, a zone where if you're a creative critical thinker, maybe you can funnel the right kind of content into that um, and, uh, and open people's eyes to things they hadn't thought of before. Um, so there's historically always a lot of skepticism about the notion of artists taking on spaces of entertainment because they're supposed to be artists, right? Art's supposed to be apart from entertainment and what often defines the fine arts is their resistance to uh, mass culture, popular culture and entertainment. Um, but it's, you know, it's been 50 years or so since people like Andy Warhol sort of flipped that upside down and said, uh, um, you know, not only can entertainment be a kind of fine art, but the, you know, the fine arts might also just be a species of entertainment too, um, just for different audiences. And so um, I think the key is always to have access to as much as you can as a practitioner and be able to work in any and all modes that come your way when your opportunity arises, seize it in effect. Um, and Williams was really like, you know, almost uniquely great at doing that. I mean, here's a guy who, um, you know, in one year was like writing for TV, um, you know, releasing an album, publishing a book and having uh, his work in a show at MoMA. Like I, name anyone else who's pulled that, you know, feed off. It's as rare as like the um, Emmy, Grammy, Tony, Oscar, you know, combination. So I mean, that to me is, is a, an example of someone who really knows how to work different cultural modes. Um, and people like Warhol, Yoko Ono, um, or others from that time period who were similarly um, good at that. There's nothing wrong with just saying, I'm a painter and burying yourself in your studio and making paintings. But if you can, if you can, you know, do seven things, why not do seven things? Um, well, well, speaking of someone who does do seven things, uh, we have a we have a comment or question from Paul Paul Riche, and he says he says Ed and I helped Mason, who devised a caper where he made this huge pie and an <laughs> enormous fork, um, and an enormous fork was lifted with. And this pie was thrown into the CBS eye at the studio in LA. It was quite a production and another great delivery from Mason's political commentary. I wonder if Mace is allowed to comment visually on this webinar. I actually don't know if he's able to do that. Um, but do you have awesome to see. I would love, love, love to know anything more about that and to see an image if there is one. Oh, he's not, he's actually not here. No, Mason's not here. Sorry about that, Paul. Um, but yeah, no, <laughs> I'd love to see that too. And here's another question. Um, if, if you don't mind, can you talk about the photograph War Babies, which is in the show? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's a, a, a charged image, obviously. For those who don't know, it was a, um, kind of an advertisement or, or promotional uh, poster uh, for an exhibition um, that Joe Good was in. Um, I think he's the only one of the, the artists in the show whose work was in the show that this was a poster for, but uh, um, uh, Jerry McMillan shot the photograph um, and it depicts uh, Joe and, and three other uh, Los Angeles artists um, around a table um, that's uh, got an American flag for a tablecloth and they're eating a, uh, a very strange meal together where um, they're a mixed race group and each person is eating uh, food that would be sort of stereotypically associated um, with their race. Um, and so uh, they're, they're making a, an image that's designed to provoke and to shock. And uh, if memory serves, um, the, the deal was that the show got canceled because the poster was too controversial um, or it closed on its opening day and then the gallery went belly up and it was a huge um, disaster, um, but also therefore a huge kind of, you know, success by way of scandal. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that image is, is a, a, another good example of this idea that um, you know, if you think about what art's becoming in the 60s and 70s as mainstream acceptance starts to, to come to it um, increasingly, um, you know, artists aren't just bohemians, you know, in, in sort of these avant-garde spaces, they're, they're starting to have more contact with the, the rest of culture. Publicity becomes really important. Um, and so in addition to the way that that poster is just calling out um, American racism and like the kind of jingoistic patriotism that we have all too much of, you know, now as then, um, or fake patriotism, really. Um, uh, that poster is also very presciently recognizing that the poster for your exhibition almost matters as much as the exhibition, if not more. Um, that uh, uh, you know that 
more people will see the poster than will go to the show. You know, more people will, um, you know, see the, the the commercial advertising a thing than the program itself. Mm -hmm. And that what goes on in that promotional space is not just there to promote, it's also just content. And I think they realized that and they realized um, that's a medium promotion. And why not say our piece here, you know, like we want to criticize our, you know, racist warring, you know, American 1960s culture. And we'll just use our promotional poster to do that. So even if you don't come to the show, you still get the message. And I think that's really um, effective thinking. It's again, like, like a lot of Williams's work, it's audience thinking, thinking about who's going to see this and how are they going to respond and how can I get the maximum amount of content into the kind of the, you know, the minimal amount of space that I'm given um, by a given, you know, format or platform. Well, I'm just going to add, so Paul answered about the pie in the eye. He says they made a group portrait of the pie in the eye crew. It was with Ingrid Mason's pretty secretary and the son of a friend of an illustrator who worked on one of Mason's books. And he's going to try to forward, for, try to forward it to us. Thank you, Paul. That'll, we'll look forward to that. Yeah, thanks so much. That's fantastic. And Robert, I was wondering, did he think of himself as an artist? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a question for him at a certain level, but uh, but I think one of the things that's great about Williams is that, you know, he is kind of a jack of all trades, man of opportunity, right? So, um, you know, when he's releasing an album, well, he's a musician or a composer or a guitarist or a singer or a songwriter. I mean, even within his musical identity, there's like five identities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think one of the really effective things about his work, I mean, I've thought of him in relationship to a kind of tradition of 20th century visual art practice that has, you know, wanted to change the world, but has failed to do so because it hasn't actually contacted enough people to do so. Um, and he was the guy who realized maybe more than anyone up to his point, hey, you actually have to get out to the people and, uh, and share the, you know, the, the word. Um, hence the uh, Oral Roberts comparison. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure he thinks of himself as an artist uh, uh, in both the sense of being a fine artist or visual artist and in the more broad sense of just creative person, right? Um, but I think one of the, the really fun things about his identity is that it just doesn't settle, um, you know, and it, it just keeps rolling around um, to be all these different things and more. Um, and then we had another question. What, is he, what has he been up to lately, do you know? Yeah, uh, so I mean, he smartly sort of just disappears from the scene in a lot of ways and had always kind of maintained this like above ground, below ground duality, which is maybe another thing I could have brought out more in the talk. Um, I mentioned the idea that on the one hand, he's got these like albums and books that have his name like blasted on the front. Like who would be so egomaniacal as to, you know, publish a book called, you know, the Mason Williams Reading Matter. Like um, at that point he was not well known, right? So you'd see that in a store and just be like, who does this guy think he is? But then at the same time, he's behind the scenes as a, as a comedy writer. And, you know, I don't think most people watching the Smothers Brothers uh, knew who he was, right? So it's this really interesting duality of like being out there and then being hidden um, at the same time or making an artwork that's for no one and then making an artwork that's for everyone. Um, and that ability to kind of uh, disappear is something that he used really kind of strategically, I think, at times in his career. Um, Marcel Duchamp also did that sort of you know, allegedly quitting art for several decades. And then we found out later on, oh no, he hadn't. He'd been just up to other things. And I think uh, Mason Williams is very similar. Um, you know, he crops up on the on the bluegrass circuit, you know, uh, routinely, but like sporadically. It's not like he's riding it, you know, every year or anything. It's, um, it's quite interesting. He picks up a gig on TV every now and again, and I'm sure cashes a royalty check for classical gas every once in a while, um, you know, to keep putting fuel in the bus, so to speak. Um, and uh, so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag of things. He's got a YouTube channel at the moment, um, which he uses not all that frequently, but more sort of archivally to post videos of older things. Um, I'd recommend checking that out. It's really kind of fun. Um, he published a book not all that long ago called The Music of Mason Williams that has um, like guitar tablature and, and notation for um, a lot of his, his musical work. So there's a sense in which he's like, again, like Duchamp, kind of keeping his own legacy um, alive by like reformatting and rethinking um, his, his earlier career and repositioning it in various ways. I, I was just thinking, I love the in the corner of, I think, Flavors and the other book that you showed, 295. <laughs> Those are still cheap, though. You can still find those because they made tens and hundreds of thousands of them. Um, the the other ones that are that are self published are harder to come by. Um, but his records are are you know in the bins at the used record store still and uh, are affordable. It's a again, it's that notion of like multiple audiences. So there's things that that you and I could never afford, and then there's things that you know I bought like almost all of his albums for about twenty bucks. You know, it's a uh, um, it's it's uh, it, 
it's a nice way of thinking of like scaling your um, your product to your audience, so to speak, so that everyone can get a piece. Well, we have a couple of comments. I just wanted to um, throw these out there so everyone can hear them. Um, uh, Mark had said that he performed at, Mason performed at the Guthrie Bluegrass Festival just a few years ago. So apparently he's still performing in Oklahoma. Um, and Christopher Blackwell actually is on the, on the, um, um, in the attendees. And he said he'll be on a plane with Alexandra, who is Patrick's um, granddaughter on our way to Oklahoma to see the exhibit in person on February 19th. Um, and so we're really excited that you all are going to be here and look forward to meeting you in person and, and sharing the exhibit with you. Um, let me see. A lot of um, um, comments in um, people who enjoyed your presentation, Robert. Right. Um, so thank you for all of you who have, who have commented. We really appreciate it. And I think, let me see, I think that we're out of questions. Um, well, I'm going to add, Paul had, had also said that he believed Mason wrote for the singer who wrote Dang Me, and, and that guy was also from Oklahoma. So, that was Roger Miller, yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, so thank you all for joining. I think um, this has been a great way to spend the afternoon. And, and Robert, we especially thank you for um, taking the time to put together this presentation and, and talk to all of us today about Mason Williams. Sure thing, um, and thanks to everyone for coming. It's a pleasure. I wanted to welcome everybody bef before we sign out to see the exhibit in person. It will be on view until March 7th in the Records Gallery. However, if you're out of state or you can't make it to Norman, there is a virtual exhibition online. And um, so you can, you can visit us that way. And we also hope that you'll join us on Friday, February 19th at 9.30 a.m. for our informal Zoom program, Coffee with the Collection. And at, at that particular instance, I'll be joined by Dr. Harold Brooks, who is a senior research scientist at the National S Severe Storm Labs. And we're gonna be discussing Joe Good's tornado paintings, which are in um, OKLA. And Dr. Brooks is a a tornado, a storm chaser, and a tornado expert. So he ought to be really interesting to hear um, talk about those paintings from, from his perspective. And you can sign up for a coffee with the collection or other upcoming Zoom programs on our events page on our website, which I believe Amanda has um, posted a link to in the chat box. Um, well, Robert, thanks so much. This was a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you everyone for joining us. We um, hope you'll stay safe and come back and we'll see you soon.